Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Surviving Scientology Radio with your host, Jeffrey Augustine. Today, we have on with us returning guest, Bill Franks. Bill, welcome to the show. Good to be here. Bill, we were talking before the show, and I want to ask you a question. Uh, you're the former Executive Director International for the Church of Scientology of California. So you were there when a lot of important things went down. But my question, when was the first time you met L. Ron Hubbard in person? What happened? Met him in uh, November of 1970. Um, I had come on board uh, his ship to uh, take the OEC FUBC. And I walked into his room and we spent about an hour just chit-chatting. Now, that had to be amazing. So the, And by the way, for our... Uh, New Scientology Watchers, the OEC FEBC course is a long, complicated course. Could you tell them what that is? Yeah, it's uh, consi the OEC o organization executive course uh, consists of all these writings uh, covering volume zero through eight, seven rather. That's all the uh, different divisions of the org board. And the FEBC was uh, written by Hubbard to uh, basically tell you how to get more cash in. <laughs> so this is so OEC FEBC is a training course for executives of the church. Now this thing is a long ass course. How how long does it take you to finish this thing? Well, I was on it for about mm, roughly two months. Now, were you, so you were living on the L. Ron Hubbard's flagship Apollo while you were working on this course? Yes, we were in Morocco. How, how exotic. Bill, I have to tell you, I'm so jealous. I've never been to Morocco or these exotic ports of call. I'm just some guy who was born in Linwood, California. Traveled around Europe, but not Morocco or Las Palmas, places you guys went. But it's it's got to be unusual for you. When you went aboard the Apollo, were you hoping to meet L. Ron Hubbard? Were you excited about it? What did you think of the man before you met him in person? Mm, I hadn't really thought about it. Uh, the fact that I walked into his study was purely by incident. I, I mean, it was just, I had not planned on it. Nobody goes into his study, and I didn't know that. <laughs> so, well, I, I mean, just, you, yeah. I guess I wanted to get some good birthing. Yeah. <laughs> So, so Ryan tells you to sit down. Now, questioner wants to know: Does he have his pack of cools on his desk? Is he smoking? Does yeah, the whole, the whole, the whole shebang. He had a soda, Coca Cola, and he's smoking his non-filtered cools. And is he wearing his his uh, cravat and his Rolex? Oh yes, so. and his commander's cap. <laughs> yeah, I saw that picture where he's there. You know. Doing that interview, so you're you're with the Commodore on the flagship. Just what did you guys talk about? Was it just sort of executive stuff, state of organizations? Well, not really. I think he was just feeling me out. I was there. Uh, I, I think he was most interested in me being with the program or not. And I, I think in forty minutes, I pretty much convinced him that I was. Now that's that's an interesting thing. He wants to see if you're on board. And that was a big deal for L. Ron Hubbard. Are you on board? Are you with us? Are you with the program? Now, uh, during your time on the ship, did you have more conversations with Ron? Yeah. Night, well, for a period of time, it was nightly because he was basically teaching part of the course. Uh, he was giving lectures. These darn things went on for hours. Uh, at night, and we had about, mm, I'm guessing, about 25 people in the course. So we'd all pile into his study, and he would start talking. Now, as a as a teacher, uh, an educator, how would you rate L. Ron Hubbard? And, well, he was pretty much intelligible. Yeah. And so you'd sit there and try to put meaning into his words, but like a lot of the policy, it just doesn't, a lot of it doesn't make any sense unless you understand why he's writing it. 
Was he verbose? I mean, did he tend to go on and on and on? Yeah, he did. And nobody was going to tell him, okay, you know, we got it, shut up. <laughs> of course not. So these, so these lectures would go on and on, and then do, was there a written component? Did you have to complete essays or? I don't recall. I don't yeah. think so. No. So, okay, so once you finish the two-month course in Ron Waves of the Magic Wand and you're an OEC FEBC completion, what did you have to do next? I was sent back to the LAOR to um, recover the stats. LAOR was considered the continental org for some reason, and <clears throat> that was my job. Had the, so the stats had crashed, and your job is there to get sales, get the income back up. Yeah. Now, now according to Hubbard, how, how did, did you succeed? How did you get the stats back up? Well, there was a lot of pressure. Um, then there was the command team that, no, take the back. There was Alex Zabersky who was the head of it, and a guy named Bill Foster, Bob Young, and, uh, Ray something or other. He was a Caltech PhD graduate. Wow. And uh, the idea was to get money to flag. You could have you could have really shitty stats, but if you got money to flag, you were, you were considered to be somebody. <laughs> so really, flag, it was really another word for L. Ron Hubbard, basically. Yes. So Hubbard, well, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. I was going to say, well, well, the flag was the ship Apollo. That was the flag land base at the time before they went ashore. That's correct. And, and L. Ron Hubbard was, now help me out here. I, you may remember, uh, Hubbard had a, a mechanism for laundering money called the RRF, like the Religious Research Foundation. Mm -hmm. I, that was on board the Apollo, and he would use that to move money to uh, Liechtenstein, Switzerland. So, but you weren't you weren't aware of that at the time, were you? That his movements of money offshore. No, I I was not. I just uh, was doing a, being a student. Well, I'm curious when you were when you were in LA. When you were the boss in LA, how was money physically transferred from Los Angeles to the flagship Apollo? What, how did the movement of money go? Our cash went to the, the cash from each org was collected by the flag banking officer, <clears throat> and the flag banking officer sent that on to whoever it was. I don't know who the go between was. But this was actually cash money, not checks, but actual cash. Mm, I don't really know. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Well, I was just curious about the physical movement of money because I've heard stories about Hubbard had a lot of people who carried large sums of cash money in suitcases on, you know, airliners and he would, they would take it off to wherever he wanted the money taken. Cash so, was king, yes. Well, cash is king in Scientology. Um, so you, um, so what happened after did you, when you got the stats up, were you promoted? Were you, when you got the stats up, were you promoted? Were you, were you moved up to a higher level organization? Yeah, I, I got promoted to, let me see, to lieutenant, I guess. I think that, um, I don't know all the mechanisms that went into it, but cash was king and that's, that's where the, the money uh, from the orgs ended up as cash. It was cash somewhere. I don't I can't tell you how. Sure, but I mean, it was it was basically it was all money moving up lines. That's and, correct. And so, as as you, your success in Scientology is measured in your ability to bring in money. Now, that's interesting because that's a metric of business. Not my thirty years in corporate sales. I got measured on cash in the door. You know, ship product invoice, collect the money, sales statistics. So you're describing basically a business. Yeah, uh, the Scienti uh, Scientology accounting method as drawn up by him, as I <clears throat> remember it, it was all done by disbursement vouchers. That was the only record and you could mess around with that, uh, but there was no uh, balance sheet, for example, none. So, <laughs> so there's no double entry accounting 
no balance no. sheet. It's no. <laughs> and Hubbard wondered why he was having problems with the IRS. Yeah, it's it's curious as to how. Well, it's curious as to why they ever gave an exemption. Yeah, there was absolutely no accounting. <laughs> None. If, if I'm laughing, is because this this just uh, this validates you know the whole. The IRS was uh, investigating Scientology. They had revoked Hubbard's uh, 1954, 1955 tax exemption in 1967 because money's inured to the personal benefit of L. Ron Hubbard. But he he fought them in court and continued to act as if he were a tax exempt entity. Meanwhile, he's working based on disbursements. Is that a piece of paper you fill out with a dollar figure on it? It, it, it's a disbursement voucher is simply uh, how much money, uh, not how much money was brought in, how much money was dispersed. So there just really wasn't a record. Would the disbursement voucher say where, where the money was dispersed? Hell no. <laughs> so, well, I mean, there'll be, there'll be people who argue this, but <clears throat> I once tried to figure this out myself. And finally gave up. But there was no double entry. There was no uh, crisis. You know, somebody could walk into uh, finance. There was no accounts receivable to speak of. There was no, it was just this disbursement voucher system. They could just scoop up whatever cash there were and that would be it. And there was no explanation needed if they had enough rank, I guess. And all the cash went up, I can, I'm sure that went up to flag. Because, you know, back then, back in that day, I can remember being given 34 cents a week. Uh, and you can't eat, figure that out. It's your problem, not ours. Well, now, if, wait, you were given 34 cents? That's just one week. That's insane. I mean, yeah, you can't. So it's your problem how you eat or do anything else. Bill, back in those days, did you smoke cigarettes? Like a plume, yes. Really? So, but just as a, a diverging for a minute, uh, my my uh, recollection of Scientology, I did a little bit in the early 80s, was that everybody smoked. Was it a like a very smoking culture? Yeah, well, everybody was nervous. <laughs> they could afford... Uh, 34 cents was the low point for me, but, you know, they could buy one pack of cigarettes was two dollars and that was it. Yeah. So you would smoke. Did you drink a lot of coffee? And yes. Well, how many hours of sleep at night would you get? Mm. Well, uh, not very much. I remember, you know, we were being jerked around all the time. There was a, supposedly a Life magazine article. Uh, you might have recalled hearing about it in 1968, English November. Uh, I remember Jackie Matisson was our our head person. And, you know, it was all this excitement. Oh, Ron's going to take care of us. Uh, wait until this article comes out. It's going to really n no more uh, eat nothing. And uh, I remember coming, everybody raced into uh, a, a, a staff meeting that, that night. She had, an eight, she had, it was at eight o'clock, and she had the uh, magazine. Well, the magazine was this tremendous hit piece, which was just a shock to everybody. Uh, how could they do this? You know, <laughs> we're the future of uh, the world. and. That's how, that's how clueless everybody was. And I mean everybody. We had, I'd say at that time, we had a quarter of the staff easily were Caltech, either graduates or Caltech students. So it wasn't a lack of education. It was just, well, I don't know. Well, that's an interesting thing because, you know, a question I'm often asked is how can educated people get involved in something like Scientology? And, and I... <clears throat> One of my answers, and in, in, certainly I'd be interested in, in, I want to know your answer, but uh, back then Scientology was a different, 
different than it was now. It was, the internet didn't exist. There was a lot more interest in human potential uh, because that was an emerging movement, human potential. And there were things like even the CIA carried on a remote viewing program to see if psychics. This movie, and this became a movie, The, the Men Who Stared at Goats with George Clooney. But they were investigated in the, in the potential power of the human mind and the belief that the human mind was unlimited, that we only use. But they were investigated in the, in the potential power of the human mind and the belief that the human mind was unlimited, that we only used the percentage of our intelligence, that intelligence could be increased, abilities could be increased, that psychic abilities existed. So you, you did have a lot of smart people who were, thought Scientology was somewhat avant-garde, but they only they were publics. So they only saw it from the outside. But yeah. w- once you got on the inside, the view changed quite a bit. Not not quickly enough, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, but I'm just saying that the caliber of, of people, you know, to have people from Caltech investigating. I know that the Stanford Research Institute, did, did you know Hal Pudoff and Ingo Swan? I, I knew Ingo very well. I had yeah. a couple of years over the house afterwards uh, in the village. Hal Pudoff, no. I met him at the uh, Celebrity Center once, but I don't know. Well, for our listeners, Hal Pudoff was a, a physicist. He worked for the CIA's remote viewing program called Operation Stargate. He was an OT. He had left the church. Ingo Swan was a cell cell psychic who was also an OT, who was also a CIA remote viewer. And you know, what was Ingo Swan like to be around in person? I mean, he he was was he a celebrity in the church? Was he considered to have supernatural abilities? Yeah, well, I don't know about that. He was an artist. Yeah. And uh, that's what was interesting about the meal. We really didn't get into Scientology. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh. But you know, I, I had washed out of the Marines. Uh, I had broken my back. Jeez. The training exercise. <clears throat> so that was my first wish. I guess the point being that it wasn't just a homogenous group joining, you know, like a bunch of uh, snowflakes. It was all sorts of people. Yeah. So it was very eclectic, a very eclectic kind of group back then. Yes. Uh I mean, Karen uh, tells stories about when she was married to Heber, they would go up to Chick Corea's house for parties, or they would go over to Milton Katsalas, the legendary acting coach, for parties. It's kind of a different different inflection. But you mentioned that you got promoted to lieutenant, which was high rank in the Sea Org. There weren't a lot of lieutenants, were there? I don't believe so. Yeah. It was all it was money. Yeah. So it's what, like you kept a little crib note there. <laughs> sure. Well, yeah, I mean, that's the same thing in, in any corporation. The more money, If you're an earner, whether it's the mafia or a corporation, you're going to get the better titles in the bigger office, the corner office. Now, you wind, you wind up in Washington, D.C. Yeah, in 1975, yes. And what's your position there in D.C.? He, once again, it was uh, as CO commanding officer I had was installed uh, basically to make money. And it was uh, that that was the founding church of Scientology meant something Hubbard and uh, it was going broke. It had gone broke and it owed hundred about five hundred thousand dollars, which I had to pay off. Well how now wait a minute the founding church, Washington DC was Hubbard's baby. I mean, you know, it's a a big deal. So, how how does the church, of uh, the founding church, get five hundred thousand dollars in debt? Uh, well, you know, the rewards were sending money to Flag. So, I guess rather than taking care of the org and its staff, they just sent a lot of money, hoping to ward off commas and other nastiness. Well, and that's very astute observation. So, to keep the wolves at bay. You let the org go into debt, but your the money up to flag makes flag happy, so you don't get your you don't get guillotined. Yeah, it was all uh, it was just the whole system was based on coercion. Well, how do you make five hundred thousand dollars to pay off the debt? 
Find somebody who's got a lot of money. <laughs> that's the that's the, that's the, that's the key. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, that's where the money's going to. So you found? Did you find enough people to pay off the debt? I mean, well, I I can't recall, but yeah. I did, I did pay off the debt, and uh, that's when you uh, promoted me to lieutenant commander. So, uh, the Commodore. Commodore Hubbard makes you a lieutenant commander. You're moving up the ranks. You had to be attracting a lot of attention in the Church of Scientology. Suddenly, you're a lieutenant commander. And uh, are you on the Guardian's office radar at this point? Yeah, Mary Sue really didn't like me, and for for reasons I have no idea. But uh, did you have to interact with Mary Sue Hubbard often, or the Guardian's well, I office? I had it. My interaction with her personally was later on, but yeah, I uh, really didn't get along with her office. Her office was involved in, you know, inter, uh, inter, what's the word? Um, Internecine warfare. <laughs> yeah, with, with the Justice Department, they had somebody there. Um, most of the most of the people to protect their. Uh, the only the only reason the objective was to protect the nonprofit status. So really, that was what they were focused on. Bill, uh, when the Guardian's office existed, and that was the, the 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 precursor of what we know as the Office of Special Affairs nowadays. Uh, during this period, people talk about the conflict, the the war between the Guardian's office and the Sea Org. You were Sea Org. Mary Sue Hubbard was Guardian's office. What kind of tensions existed in the church between the two groups? Uh, every day, it was daily. And uh, <clears throat> it was Mary Sue, it was, it was all about power. And I was basically told hands off, he's making money. Mm. In a nutshell, that's what it was. Yeah, because L. Ron Hubbard wrote that if you're making money, you could get away with murder. Well, not quite, but... Uh, well, I mean, he's, yeah. he's, it's a figure of speech, but he's saying that you, you have a great deal of protection. Yeah. So the Guardian's office and the Sea Org, it was a fight for power. And... And, and see what nobody uh, in the Guardian's office figured out, maybe because Mary Sue was his wife, they said he was just using her, and he was using them, uh, being the guardian's office, to protect him from going to jail. And that's why it was so easy, you know, several years later for him to uh, remove Mary Sue. Bill, I'm glad you said that, because that really was the entire purpose of the guardian's office, is to keep L. Ron Hubbard out of prison. And... and you could make the case that the Office of Special Affairs' primary mission, it has a lot of missions, but its primary mission is to keep David Miscavige from being criminally charged with anything. And well, yeah. Well, what I've said before, uh, one of the most, uh, I told a, a journalist this, and Karen and I made a video about it. Do you know the most dangerous job in all of Scientology? Uh, danger how? Just danger to yourself in every way. Well, <clears throat> I'll, I'll tell you what we our answer was, and, and I'll bounce it off you and get your thoughts on it. The most dangerous job in the Church of Scientology is being the wife of the leader. Well, I, w I would agree with that. I would. It was certainly mean streets to have to remove her on Hubbard's behalf much later. <clears throat> well, then, then let's back up a little bit. You you become a lieutenant commander. When and how does L. Ron Hubbard sit down with you and say, "Bill, I want you to be the executive director international," and. I'll preface this by saying that L. Ron Hubbard had been the executive at director international. He resigned in, in 1967, I believe, 66, 67. 
Yeah. So that it would appear that he wasn't running the church. So you're basically stepping into the job he had. How does it happen that you become executive director international? Uh, <clears throat> he appointed me in, I think it was November, maybe even December 1980. Basically, I, I guess I was going to be, you know, he was going to try to direct the fire at me. So, I, I've, actually, I've actually been told by the FBI that. Really? What did the FBI say? Just that. Really? So you, would it be fair to say that when, when Ron appointed you executive director of National, he was setting you up to be a fall guy? Yes. I, Laurel Watson was the one who uh, was, <clears throat> she had a mission called All Clear, meant all clear for his ass. And that's why he put me there, basically to, you know, suck up the, uh, all the crimes, to take responsibility for all the crimes. Oh, that's very, that's a very telling indictment because in the same way, Mary Sue Hubbard over on the Guardian's office side has to take the fall for Ron's program, Snow White. And then on the, on the Sea Org side, you're there to take the fall for anything that goes on in Church of Scientology of California. Yeah, and the irony is every single thing, including uh, Snow White, every single thing that uh, every violation was Hubbard ordering Mary Sue, in this case, Mary Sue to do it. And of course, Mary Sue, being another true believer, just said, sure, Ron, you know. <clears throat> so uh, he had no, he never, he never, he was not aware, there was no compassion from this guy. He wanted money and that's what this is all about. So it didn't really matter whether it was uh, his wife or you or anyone else. You got, you all could be thrown under the bus in his lust for wealth. Yeah. So I think that people who can't quite figure out because it's they have to take a step back. It took me years to get my head flushed enough and put together all these pieces that Hubbard uh, was in 1972. He on a rant. I think I've said this before about how great money and power is. Uh, you would think that he would keep that uh, to himself, but he didn't. This was early in the morning and I was the only one there to, to see it. And then he mentioned it many, many times. So his whole thing is, you know, go back to 1949 and ask when he, when he announced, if you want to make a lot of money, start a religion. That's what he did. Yeah, and I, and I would add to that, uh, I would add to that that uh, L. Ron Hubbard was a writer, and the way he made money was through royalties. And this is important if you're going to understand how Scientology, the Church of, works. The entire design function of the Church is that monies must be paid to the author. And even now, his estate collects royalties. So he set this up as his business designed to pay him royalties. And we spoke in our last podcast how when the mission holders began to become more, become too powerful, too influential and in making too much money, Hubbard didn't like that. So he ordered the mission holders to be destroyed. Yes, but that was not a new decision. He had, he had been planning on this going back to, uh, well, quite a while ago. Well, part of the he reason- just, He just saw them as potential trouble sources. Now, that's an interesting term, a potential trouble source, as interpreted by L. Ron Hubbard. That means a threat to him and not a threat to the organization. Right. So you have to watch how he uses language. Because he, uh, many of the mission holders were declared suppressive persons, were they not? I believe. Well, I don't know about all of them, but most of them, yes. And many of them were declared SPs. Some of them, some of them the church sued or they sued the church. And Mary Sue Hubbard was never declared a suppressive person, but she became something worse, perhaps. She became a non-person. Right. Much in the same way Shelley Miscavige is a non-person. That's correct. You know, Bill, just- Except, except that Miscavige is 
wife didn't go to jail. Mary Sue did. The order from Hubbard was, and he told, gave me this tr directly, was that she was to cease all activities and uh, go to jail. And if she didn't, uh, everybody, all, all the remaining kids, of course, uh, Quentin was gone. Uh, nobody would get any money. So that was his threat to Mary Sue for her to stop her legal battle, go go to jail or the kids, and she would not get any money. Mm -hmm. That's a big threat. That shows uh, the evil of disconnection and what he was willing to do to his own family if she didn't obey his iron will. Now, when you were executive director international, were you promoted from lieutenant commander to captain? No, that, that would have been too much power. So, no, I was not. I'm just curious because there's so few captains in Scientology. Uh, David Miscavige is a, is a captain in the Sea Org. He doesn't like to be called captain. There was a big to-do in the uh, Rathbun trial. Don't His attorney insisted, don't call my client Captain Miscavige. And in terms of that trial, one of the things in the Rathbun trial, the church argued that the Sea Org doesn't really exist and it's purely honorary whereas ray jeffrey argued that the sea org runs everything in scientology how does the sea org function in the church of scientology i don't know now but uh, all these different entities that he set up over the years yeah. were, if, if they weren't involved in money collection uh, he eventually got rid of them so really, the Sea Org was like his his operating arm to run the church. Yep. Or, or I, I mean, that's how I see it. It's it just sort of an operating arm. Even if it, and it's a gain to, for them to say it doesn't exist when it actually, the Sea Org is a big deal. I mean, it's, it's the management arm of the church. Well, what are the things you had to do as executive director international? What were the first orders Hubbard gave you? What was like... Uh, what did he say? These are the three or four things I want done right now, Bill. Well, the, f the first thing was to remove Mary Sue. I had to fly out to L.A. We had a meeting, we meeting David Miscavige and myself. We called her up to uh, the suite at the Hotel Bonaventure and informed her that she was out and, and gave her the consequences of fighting it. That was the first thing. Second thing was to remove everybody from the guardian's office, um, which I did. How do, how do you remove them from the guardian's office? Do you declare them or how, how, how do you actually physically remove them? I mean, legally, physically, how does that take place? I'm really interested. In most of your power cows, you know, somebody ought to ask him what they thought of the, uh, this, just, uh, the accounting system. I think he was sort of an honest guy who wanted to, to, you know, build a real accounting system. Now, Forget Herbie, it. Herbie was a CPA, right? Yeah. And so, when you remove Guardian's office personnel, was it a matter of calling them up and say, "Hey, you're fired," or clean out your desk and be gone by the end of the day? How how do you actually get rid of them? What's the mechanics of it? That is how uh, we did it with Herbie. We, I don't remember him coming over. We uh, called him up at East Grinstead and told him he was out. And that was that. Now, same, thing, same thing with Jane Kemper. Now, what how Bill, David Miscavige, in one of his depositions going way back, he relates a story where the Guardian's office locked themselves in a building and wouldn't come out. Like, was there, well, a, was there that, did that happen? Yes, uh, that did happen in the in the U.S. at Mary Sue's order, but that lasted a half a day. So this was sort of Mary Sue's last stand. Yes. And were you there when it happened? I mean, was this in D.C. or? No, this was at, in L.A. And yes, I was there. So, did, were you communicating by phone, like Mary Sue, you're going to have to come out? Just you guys are gonna have to come out of the building. It's over with. Yeah, it was sort of come out, come out wherever you are. Yeah, it was just 
So does Mary Sue come out a broken woman? I mean, it's a broken... She must, she must have after the meeting that Miscavige and I had with her. I mean, that's pretty mean, mean. Um, sure. Hey, look, at her age, who wants to go to prison, right? You bet. And that's a pretty brutal reality, is it? No adult wants their freedom taken away. No, nobody, nobody wants to go to prison. And for her to fall from such heights, to know that that's, that's the EP, the in phenomena of Scientology for her as a jail cell, that had to be pretty brutal to be taken away from her children and something that she'd helped to create. Yes, that's true. She was a broken woman. <clears throat> and Hubbard had absolutely no mercy. Hubbard, so everybody, you know, tries to make sense of all these different moves over the years. And there isn't making any sense unless you realize that this is exactly what he said in 1949, I believe. If you want to make a lot of money, start a religion. Yeah. It, he, that was it. There was no other motivation. You know what's interesting is I, I believe it's um, Hubbard. I think it's the Simon Boulevard policy said that um, you always have to be giving them a new game, or the big game becomes getting you. Yeah. And so he's endlessly creating different versions of clear. You know, like through through from. Uh, 1950, there was a Dianetics, Clear Dianetics released, and there was a, the Clear in Scientology, Past Life Clear, Theta Clear, all these different versions of Clear. <clears throat> Once he did the clearing course, and you had John McMaster, the world's first Clear, then you had um, to go on to the OT levels and so on. So he's continually, from, from a corporate perspective, he's continually doing uh, product line extensions new product innovations different things to, uh, I'm but, trying to think what he used to call it he said you got to come up with new ideas to make more money yeah <laughs> and your your goal was to just implement his policy to make more money unfortunately yes at, at the end of the day now when you say that he, he set you up for a fall how did that fall come about well I was in contact with the FBI come November, December. This is after they had kidnapped me. And uh, I pointed out to them that there was a constitution uh, and that I had rights. And yeah. so I called the FBI and uh, you know, I just wasn't going to buy this stuff. Had, said, you, had you been fired from your position? You were out of the church when you called the FBI? No, not yet, but I was. I saw the writing on the wall. That's stunning. So when you call the FBI, what did you want to inform them about? That I had been kidnapped and that um, they'd be hearing from me. So, <laughs> so that's, so what happened? What did the FBI say? What, what, when did you meet with them? I didn't meet with them until I was out of the church in, in January of 82. Yeah. That had to be a huge shift in your reality to go from being the, the, you know, one of the guys at the top to talking to the FBI. Did they, when you're meeting with the FBI, they must have listened with great interest and asked a lot of questions. Yes, they did. <clears throat> but I, you know, uh, as I said, it's taken me a long time to flush all this dissonance out of my mind. Uh, but uh, I wish I could articulate that it was just a scam. That's all it was. Nothing else. People who try to make something out of nothing end up with nothing. And, and there really, there was nothing else other than a plan to make money. Yeah. And and that plan was achieved by using psychomechanics, undue influence, threat, force, coercion, flattery, whatever, whatever it took, finding a person's ruin, finding what they wanted. When did it dawn on you that it was a scam? 
Well, it's pretty slow going. I, I'd like to say it were faster, but it, it took a long ways to, a lot of time to flush this out. I mean, I remember Flynn, uh, Mike Flynn. He yeah. was an attorney of mine. Uh, this would have been in February or March. And he said to me, he said, did you see what Hubbard did uh, by bombing, you know, uh, islands off of Mexico during World War II? And I said, oh, that can't be true. That can't be true. I was still holding the flame on most for a lot of different things. Because tr true belief dies hard. Yeah. You know, and it, and it did. I mean, it's in the naval. It's in the record that Hubbard shelled one of the Coronado's Islands, you know, that was inhabited. And there was a diplomatic complaint filed with by the Mexican government. And this uh, created a, quite a flap. So you, you wanted, and does this go to the way Hubbard, Hubbard's, let's call it his system of psychomechanics. Did you believe you, you were permanently damaged by Scientology and you would never recover psychologically? No, I never thought that. Yeah, but you, so you, you were optimistic. You knew you could recover from it. It just. Yeah, I just had to get all this shit out of my head. Now, and that's, that's taken a lot of years. It's sort of a solo journey, you know? Sure. Well, Leah Remini's show, you know, dealing with um, the aftermath, that's what the show is called, Scientology in the Aftermath. Leah's show, and she's a very courageous woman in doing this show. It has cost her hell, Mike Rinder hell. I mean, Scientology has fought this Leah's show every step of the way. And every guest that's appeared they've attacked Disney because Disney owns A&E and and they're <laughs> fighting every step of the way. Right. Now, you were at one time at, you know, 100,000 foot altitude in Scientology. Moving now to Leah Remini's show, what's your opinion of what it's like inside the church as Leah Remini's show goes into its third season and it's won an Emmy and it's really making an impact? Well, I don't know. I. Uh... I've never watched, I watched just a part of the one show. Yeah. Uh, I was supposed to be invited. And I think that uh, it's, everybody's working, working it out. You know, it's like working nothing out. There, uh, there was never any, any uh, <laughs> plan to clear the planet. There was no technology, absolutely none. But he wrote reams and reams of paper because he was a pulp writer. Uh, but Jesus, I guess it's very hard to come uh, to face to face with the fact that there's nothing there. Uh, yeah, the emperor has no clothes. Yeah, and it's it's a sad sad thing. I take that back. I've heard, I've, I've seen a little bit of it, and you know, like people who they want to believe, but there's nothing there. Uh, it's very hard to explain that to anybody. So I just kept my mouth shut, basically. Sure, because it, especially before the internet, there was no one you could really talk to about it. Uh, and, and, and the church followed you for an, quite a number of years after you left, didn't you? You told Is me it, the story about a PI coming to your office. Oh yeah, it, it was just, just damn ridiculous. I had an office uh, 45 Rockefeller Plaza. That's the one with the uh, Atlas holding a globe. Yeah. And this guy, every single day, I happened to notice he was there when I get off the subway. And uh, he wore big spongy shoes. <laughs> and one day I invited him in for a cup of coffee. And I'd say we sort of became friends. And he said to me uh, that this is the best best gig he ever made. He said he's making lots of money, and you know I, he doesn't even bother. He says he turns in a report every day. Uh, yes, he got to his office, <laughs> and that's it. So, wow, easy money. I I just on a, a tangent. I met one of the detectives that um, private investigators rather that I met both of the private investigators that followed Pat Broker for twenty five years. <clears throat> this was when they had filed the lawsuit before they settled with the church. 
It's and, amazing. Uh, I'll go ahead. I was just going to say it's amazing. For what? Pat Brooker stole a couple million dollars. I'd say more power to him. I mean, he was at, at in, not at input at, at the ranch when Hubbard died. He, there was couple, there was a couple million dollars in cash just stuffed in his pocket. Why not? <laughs> Nothing else. Uh, I did I did a mission with Pat Broker back in '71 in Boston. Really a nice guy, and had big hopes like everybody else had, and ended up with nothing, nothing. So, personally, that's how I feel about it. Yeah, yeah. I remember well when I met the I met the two PIs uh, who had spied on Pat Broker, and uh, they. They would get a call from David Miscavige, a voice they later recognize as David Miscavige. Mm -hmm. And Miscavige would just simply say, what do you got for me? And they would report on what's Pat doing. Now, to me, that's money inuring only to the paranoia of David Miscavige, not tax-exempt dollars. And so this David Miscavige is, is trapped in the same way Hubbard is trapped by the machine. He has got to harm a lot of people. He's got to lie about a lot of things. He has to try to destroy free speech of others, destroy Leah Remini, Mike Rinder, my wife Karen. And, you know, I can just go down the list to keep this Church of Scientology going. Yeah, it's like right now, what, what keeps, I guess, Scientology alive is this phantom enemy. There is no enemy. And the fact is, there's nothing to be uh, an enemy about. There's no technology. There's no suppression. I'm not saying things don't suck in the world. They do. But as far as Scientology goes, it's crickets. There isn't any um, uh, thing to protect, you know, Bill, it's so fascinating you would say that. Hubbard talked about Thetans mocking things up. And and what you just said is there's nothing going on. There's no big pharma, no smirch, no Interpol. There's nothing attacking Scientology organizations. And there's nothing stopping Scientology organizations. And And yet... Because I have to tell you, I could care less. I've said on this show many times, if you want auditing in the church, knock yourself out. Get as much as you can afford. I don't care. I'm a civil libertarian. I'm not stopping anyone from getting auditing. I'm not stopping Scientology. But as far as these guys making enemies and creating phantoms, there's nothing, there's nothing out here. They're creating their own opposition through their aggressive behavior. That's exactly right. It's, uh, you know, they need enemies. So, well, well, Hubbard, I wanted to ask you, Hubbard was paranoid, of course. You saw that. Mm -hmm. How did his paranoia manifest? Did, did, did he really think there were enemies or did he just create enemies for Scientologists to have enemies? The biggest response I used to see from him was when he thought anybody was stealing his money. <laughs> that was it. So that was really his big button. Yeah. And yet, according to Hubbard, the thing that you despise in others is that what you're secretly doing, correct? Yes, that's what he says. So if he's stealing the money of others, then naturally he would viciously react to his money being stolen. Yes. And the amazing thing, Bill, Ron wrote prodigiously. He has the green volumes, which is like a set of encyclopedias, the red volumes, <clears throat> the research series all his books, Science of Survival, all his congresses, right? Yes. And he's very, very busy setting up the Guardian's office to infiltrate government agencies to burglarize things. I mean, L. Ron Hubbard stayed busy. Uh, you know, personally, when he bought St. Hill Manor, 
in uh, 1959. <clears throat> he was born in 1911, so so by that time, you know, he's 50 years old. He could have retired at St. Hill and been a country gentleman and called it a day. He had enough money to at that time. But w what do you think it was that kept him so busy and drove him so intensely? Was it this desire for power and money at the end of the day? That was how you would summarize his character and person? I'll just repeat back what he said to me. He said to me several times, he says, Bill, I can't believe my thirst for money and power. He says, I can't believe it. It's just unquenchable. Wow. And that's that's a pretty close quotation. And he said that to me several times. Uh, you know, and, and Bill, that's a remarkable thing for him to say, this unquenchable lust for money and power. Because at a certain point, he did have enough money to retire and have an easy life, but he didn't want to. He kept going literally to the day he died. Now, alternately, he could have got auditing for the question, why do you have an unquenchable desire for money and power, Ron? That's something you could break down in auditing. Concerning concerning an unquenchable lust for money and power, you know, then you would do auditing questions, right? Yeah. But, <laughs> but I, remember, I remember the uh, class 12 auditors tell, talking to me and several other people in, in 70, early 72 on the ship. They had been trying to audit him and he, he wouldn't let anybody near him. He sort of got chained into uh, getting auditing, but he wouldn't let anyone near him. Oh, yeah, you are you are correct, sir. Because, uh, you know, Otto Roos on the ship, as the story goes, and you could perhaps comment on it. Otto Roos uh, said that he wanted to audit L. Ron Hubbard. And uh, L. Ron Hubbard supposedly says, you know, where it's the effect, well, thank God someone's finally caring about me. Mm -hmm. And so Otto gets all the files. And he basically tells, you know, Ron that there were rock slams. Right. Which is not a good thing. It's an, a needle phenomenon, which means you got something going on, some withholds and evil. And Ron got pissed that Otto called rock slams. And Mary Suga was furious with Otto. Is, is that the, at the point at which L. Ron Hubbard slugs Otto Roos? Yeah, uh, <laughs> I was I was part of that conversation. What and happened in that? Just that. Uh, the auditing was either between uh, uh, him and also a woman named Lisa Klingvall and Tommy Klingvall. They were uh, Swedish. And yeah, that's what you heard is what you said is exactly right. That is so weird. So does word go around the ship that, that Ron slugged Otto? Uh, I wish I had seen the fight. Uh, I just I just heard about it. Too bad it wasn't on pay-per-view. I would have paid to watch that. Uh, you know, Hubbard Hubbard's not exactly, you know, a physical specimen. You know, not like you know, a boxer or anything, but still getting slugged. And that just speaks to the fact that Scientology was a culture of violence at the top long before David Miscavige came along. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But there were... Uh, but there were and the, the reason is, is Hubbard needed... He needed bad guys. He needed people who were attacking church, the church, mm -hmm. real or imagined. That was his MO. So he could keep Scientologists in a state of agitation, fear, paranoia, wanting to fight their enemies. Into it, yeah, keep them in a defensive posture. You know, I probably shouldn't say this, but I will. I've met more than a few people who were at the Guardian's office. Mm -hmm. And my opinion of them is they, several of them I've met have no moral conscience. They just, <laughs> they just don't have a sense of good and evil. You can't tell them that it was wrong to engage in breaking and entering, burglary, wiretapping, ruining people's lives. They see themselves as holy warriors, as Scientology jihadists who are doing the greatest good for the greatest number of dynamics. Mm -hmm. And 
I am just it's out it's an outrage when you talk to someone who's still a true believer even though their lives were ruined by the church they're still very much believing that that the church is an organization that will clear the planet and they're still very much buying the program and they still are justifying the evil they did when they were in and they will never believe that operation snow white or program snow white was evil they think the church had the right to go on and you know take its pound of flesh from the government because the government had investigated it and harassed it they seem to think that scientology was equivalent power to the united states government that's that's well put oh thank you but just the idea that that they're they think they're a power unto themselves or a law unto themselves and at the very top at the end of the day to me l ron hubbard wanted to be a law unto himself in the pursuit of money and anyone who got in his way would be destroyed he proved it many times over yeah well, I'm glad, I, I, I'm very glad that you survived the entire experience and it took years and years to decompress. Bill, as we, as we sum up the interview, for people who are in the church and want to leave, what would you say to them, what's the way out and how do they best heal? How do they decompress? What did you do that helped you? I don't know. I ideologies are very, very hard to break into and because uh, it's a system of belief that doesn't require any thinking. I think I mentioned that last time. Yes. And, uh, well, did you have any pivotal events or was it time itself that sort of lessened? It was the time itself. It was getting out in the real world and having to earn a real living. <laughs> and uh, just, it's like a process. And in doing that process, I, I started unwinding. Uh, I'm sort of embarrassed about some of the beliefs I kept over the years, but I'd say after about six or seven years, I I was free of all that stuff. So you would you were sadder but wiser. Do yeah. You do you think humility was an important component in your healing, having a certain humility about it? Well, when you're out in the real world and trying to build a family and uh, earn a living. That's that. That in itself is a process that creates humility. Mm. And I, I'd say just get to work, get a real job, and just start peeling these things off as they come up. So it's very much a day by day process for you over time. I found it to be that way. Yeah, and there's and no quick bullet. Yeah, and I admire you for going through it and others who, who, who have gone through it. Because it, 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 an ideology, as you say, is something that some people, it's like the Truman Show, like for, for Tori Christman, it's like a, a, a hammer shattering a pane of glass. It just explodes and it's gone. Other people, more so it takes time. Like, what did I go through? What the hell happened to me? How could I believe that? And that's why that's why I'm glad you're speaking out. The help doesn't come from deep uh, programming, all that kind of stuff. You, you, people just uh, they resist that. It's get out and you know find something that appeals to you, like getting a wife, getting a husband, maybe even a child. And uh, after you've done a couple of uh, midnight runs with the hot water and the, uh, rather the hot milk, you know, it's, it's very uh, cathartic. Sure, it's humanizing. And in fact, that's the Buddhist, one of the, one of Buddha's Eightfold Path is right work. That, that there's a healing quality to work, to, to good work. And, uh, I, I agree with you. It takes a lot of humility, you know, but you're not going to, Nobody's going to buy your bullshit out in the real world. They just won't. Because no. they're, all, they're all doing the same thing. They're all trying to earn a living and, and get ahead. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, and they can see, see through it. And this is why if you're, uh, 
You know, it's interesting. Religious people have a conflict, and, and that's why they talk about the world as if it's a separate place or thing of which they're not a part. When they realize they're very much a part of the world and they don't need their ideology, then they can mainstream, you know? Yeah, and, like it or not, they are a part of the world. Yeah, you, you, you keep, we're all, we all arise in the common world. We all breathe the same air. We're all humans, so there's no... Being a Scientologist doesn't make you better, different, or more elite. It just means you have a very unique set of problems <laughs> that other people you know, don't care to have. <laughs> if you don't mind me saying so, I'm, currently I'm fighting this terminal disease, and it's like, uh, I, it just sounds really wishy, but I found a lot of love out there. Yeah. And I've come to, I've, I've come to, uh, I don't know if that's something people can relate to, but in love and, and keeping a, uh, a broad outlook on life, and, and you you accomplish all this stuff will go away, all of it. Mm. It just may take a while. Yeah, <clears throat> the power of love. Yeah, uh, well, I, I wouldn't use that phrase, but it's like there's so much out there and no. uh, it may sound like bullshit, but it's not. No, it's take, not. Take it from somebody who learned the hard way. Yeah, we do. We do. I thank you so much for being uh, on the show, Bill. All right. Well, I hope I've helped some people. Maybe not, but. Well, this is an important part of of the oral history of Scientology, you know, because you were there. And, uh, you know, Karen and I, you're a very dear friend. We love you and we uh, wish you all the best in, you, in your fight. Uh, and we'll stay in very good touch with you. Yeah, well, I intend on to do the same, same thing. Okay, Bill. Well, thanks for being on the show again and for Surviving Scientology Radio. This has been your host, Jeffrey Augustine with Bill Franks. Thank you so much for listening. As always, we'll be in very good touch. Okay, I'll oh. call Karen. Tell Karen for tomorrow. Okay, Bill. Okay, Bill. thank you. Okay, love you. Bye bye. Thank you.